without any further ado, I know some of you have been waiting for this part of the service. Let's get into our dad jokes. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and some of you are waiting to get past this part of the service. I understand. What do you call a nocturnal bird wearing a suit of armor? A night owl. Yeah, yeah you got it. <laughs> My mother uses lemon juice for her complexion. Maybe that's why she always looks so sour. And I'm not talking about my mom. <laughs> Love you, mom. <laughs> so how do hurricanes know where they're going? Well, they look with their eye. Oh, I know. Okay, this last one's been my favorite. I've used this all week. Some of you may know this one already. What do you call a popsicle that's full of holes? A popesicle because it's holy. <laughs> oh, come on. That was genius. <laughs> oh, I thought it was funny. I heard a statistic that kids, children, infants and toddlers laugh like 315 times a day. And as adults, we laugh maybe 12. Maybe it's time to start acting like kids at times, you know. Let's get a little joy in our lives. Uh, Merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Amen. All right. Well, would you please stand with me one more time as we read from the word of the Lord this morning. We're going to be reading from Acts chapter 9, verses 19 through 31. This morning's title is Back to School. Um, we do have the scriptures, but we don't have, I don't have a PowerPoint for you this morning, so you have to listen carefully. Here we go, Acts 9, 19 through 31. I'm reading from the New King James this morning. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached Christ, the Christ in synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those things called, uh, who called on, on his name in Jerusalem? And has he come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. <laughs> That'll bless you. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and set him out to Tarsus. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and were in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Well, isn't that something? Well, let's pray. Lord, I just pray that we had, would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to comprehend what you have for us this morning. And we receive from you. We choose to listen and obey. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You can smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. How many would agree that God has lessons to teach us if we're just willing to listen? So the past few weeks, many of us have been sending kids back to school or going back to work as teachers. And uh, I know some of you are like, yes, amen. Others are like, no, but that's okay. A teacher asked her student, why don't you brush your teeth? I can see what you had for breakfast this morning. And the little boy said, what did I have? And she said, eggs. And the boy said, you're wrong. That was yesterday. <laughs> Strangely enough, in that same class, a girl student uh, said to a boy student, too bad you flunked the test. How far were you from the right answers? And he said, two seats. <laughs> Our passage this morning, Paul talks about, or uh, this morning we're going to talk about is Saul going back to school. Some of you know the account of Saul becoming Paul uh, when he, on the road to Damascus. And the experience that we just read in the passage, the passage of scriptures we just read, happens right after he had his experience on the road to Damascus. 
And for those who may not remember, Saul was heading to, headed to Damascus. He was going to find those believers, buddy. He had papers in hand. He was going to go find them, throw them into jail, persecute them, take away their homes, their 401ks, and anything else he could find. But on his way, he had an encounter. As if he had an encounter with the one, Jesus Christ. A huge encounter. The Lord Jesus Christ shows up. There's a bright light. There's a sound from heaven. And Jesus says, Saul, Saul, how hard is it for you to kick against the goads? If you don't know what a goad is, it's probably because we don't use them that often. It's a long, sharp, pointy stick. And you goad your cattle to get them to move. It's kind of like spurs on a heel, except for it's a long rod. And he's telling Saul, it's hard for you to kick against those things. And you're not going to make a goad hurt you're not going to hurt the goat. All you're going to do is hurt yourself, and that's what Saul was doing. He was trying to persecute the church, but he, in reality, all he was doing is hurting himself. Saul had an encounter with Jesus. Saul says, who are you, Lord? At least he got part of it right. Lord. And Jesus said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, you got to understand from scriptures who was Paul persecuting. He was persecuting the church, or Saul, I should say, because he hadn't had his name changed yet. He was persecuting the church, but when you persecute the church, you're persecuting the body of Jesus Christ. So when you are under persecution, I want to let you know you are not alone because you are part of the body of Jesus Christ. And when you're under persecution, he is being persecuted with you. That makes me feel a little better, not by myself. And I know the one that got persecuted the one that had his back whipped, the one that was pierced and nailed to the cross, that same one was not dead for long, but three days later he rose from the dead so that the persecution I may be facing right now is not going to last forever. Oh, glory. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. The persecution you are facing right now will not last forever. And you are not in it by yourself. Don't ever get the woe is me mentality. Because you're not in it by yourself. You are part of the body of Christ. And when you are persecuted for the, for the cause of Christ, Christ himself is being persecuted. Your brothers and sisters should be feeling your pain as well. Because how many know when you get something in your eyeball, everything stops to take care of the eye? Amen? If you get a splinter in your foot, everything stops to get the splinter out, does it not? Your, your hand doesn't tell your foot, suck it up, buttercup. Just deal with it. I had one in my, my, my finger the other week, and you just deal with it. No, what happens is everything stops. Your hands take your, your shoes and off or your, your sock off. We have wooden floors in our house. They're very old wooden floors. And these wooden floors, I don't know if you know this or not, but wooden floors, if you don't take care of them, they'll splinter. And there have been many a times when your pastor and his family have stepped on splinters in our household. And we've never looked at each other and said, oh, you just deal with it. Suck it up. That's your problem now, pal. Uh Uh-uh. What happens is we try and help one another. There have been times, I know this is hard to believe with this this physique right here, but I can't get to certain parts of my foot. (laughs) And I've needed help. Help! And my wife has helped me get splinters out of my feet. Amen? It's the same way in the body of Christ. When our brothers and sisters are being persecuted, instead of just standing off from afar, we should be hurting with them and helping them as best we can. We may not understand what they're going through, but we can at least help them get through it. This is bonus material. I'm hearing this for the first time too. It's that time of year. Let me get back into here. Back to school. So our passage we just read, i got to get back to my notes. Here we go. Welcome back. Uh, Saul's experience he just happened, uh, has just happened on the road to Damascus. And as you read through the beginning of Acts 9, you'll find that Saul was saved instantly, but his journey to become an apostle Paul took some time. He, Saul was highly educated. If you've ever done some, some, some study, you'll find that he was highly educated. He, was, he grew up in Tarsus, Roman province. He learned about the Greek philosophy, pagan religions. When he was old enough, he studied at the feet of the rabbi Gamaliel. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a card-carrying member of the Pharisee party. He was a member of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, which is comprised of high priests, former high priests, members of prestigious families, which high priests came from. There was elders of groups, scribes, lawyers. You see, he is the the cream of the crop right here when it came to the religious. But God sent Saul to school, back to school. Three of them, actually. 
and he taught him some things. And I want us to go back to school today and see how God wants to teach us. So our first school this morning, God will school you at the school of solitude. School of solitude is our four, and all three of these schools start with S's, just giving you a heads up. Many, many God has used in incredible ways in and for the kingdom, spent enormous amounts of time alone with God. Saul had been converted, and then in Galatians 1.18, he went to Arabia for three years. In Arabia, he practiced personal evangelism and had tremendous season of personal spiritual growth. Galatians 1.16 tells us this, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Paul is saying, I didn't immediately go to people, but I went to the Spirit. So for three years, Paul had an opportunity to be taught of the Lord. He spent it in prayer, in study, in meditation, and met with the Lord alone. He went into the desert, old school Saul, bitterness, hard, and hatred, and, 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 and he was just scarred going into school. This was the old, old Saul, but he came out tender-hearted Apostle Paul. So he went in hard-hearted Saul, and he came out tender-hearted Apostle Paul. He went in with the law of the Old Testament, and he came out with a book of Romans in his heart. God used the University of Solitude to form Saul into Paul. Moses is another alumni from the University of Solitude. You can divide Moses' life into three sections of 40 years. The first 40 years, Moses spent in Pharaoh's house, and you know the account. He went out one day and saw somebody beating a fellow Israelite, and he killed that, that Egyptian, and then he runs into the He finds out that this thing had been known, and he ran to the desert. So the next 40 years, he spent in the Arabian desert, it's the same desert that Paul spends three years in, 1,500 years later, which is fascinating. And in the third uh, 40 years of Moses' life, he was leading the children of Israel to the promised land. What was the most important part of his life? The desert. The third wouldn't have happened without the solitude of Arabia. The third portion of his life wouldn't have happened had he not had that time of solitude with the Lord. Remember, the last thing that, that Moses did before he left Pharaoh's house was murder. He took things into his own hands. He was leading on to his own understanding. God took him to the desert and sandblasted the pride out of him. Anybody here ever been to a desert before? Some of you have served in the desert. <laughs> Bless you. But you've ever been to the desert. Desert's rough. It's rough on vehicles. It's rough on people. It's a, if, if you've got a vehicle with rust on the bottom of it, you can take it out into the desert and drive it around for a few hours. It will sandblast the bottom clean. I don't think we've got any deserts nearby, and I don't think they allow you to drive on the beaches here in South Carolina. Some parts of Florida they used to, and that was a blast, by the way. Where oh, Desert, sandblasting, that's right. Moses was in the desert, and the Lord's just taking, and Paul went into the desert taking care of things off of him. It was in solitude. We know a little bit about Jesus years. We know, let me phrase this We know very little about Jesus between the time that he was born until the time that he was 30. We know there were years of obscurity and solitude, most likely prayer, study, and meditation. He didn't just show up one day and say, Hey, world, I'm here. I'm available for revival meetings. Healing crusades, etc. Just call me now, book me. 1 800 Jesus saves. He didn't do that, did he? As a matter of fact, we, we studied his first miracle a few weeks ago. We found out Jesus' first public miracle, we need to, we, I want to clarify this, his first public miracle was when he turned the water into the wine. He went to a wedding and they ran out of wine and Jesus' mother looks at Jesus and says, Hey, they've got no more wine. And what's Jesus' words to his mother? Woman, what has that to do with me? My time has not yet come. He wasn't being disrespectful to his mama. He was just letting her know, my time hadn't come yet. But he went ahead and honored his mother and performed that miracle. Why? Because he's Jesus. He's just awesome like that. So we see Jesus' first public miracle. We don't have much information at all between the time that we, you know, his miraculous birth and, and probably from about the time of 12 to 30. And then he shows up and the next time we see it, with Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. The first thing Jesus did in his ministry was to go to the desert for 40 days for prayer and fasting. He whipped the devil personally before going out and telling others how to do the same. I love that. We've been kicking the devil in the teeth the last few weeks, and he's not happy about that. I'm glad you're here this morning. Those of you that are listening online, whichever camera you're looking at me from, I'm glad you're here this morning. <laughs> 
May we have ears to hear and, and hearts to respond. And that means to apply the things God is giving us. Amen? Mark 1, 35, now in the morning, having risen long while before the, the daylight, he, Jesus, went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. You'll find this throughout the Word of God in the New Testament. You'll find that Jesus prays and fasts, and then miracles happen. In the morning, he goes and gets into solitude. Why? He's, he's not by himself. There's a difference between solitude and isolation. Solitude is something to look forward to, and I'm getting ahead of myself in my notes, but that's okay. In solitude as a believer, we get in solitude with the creator of the universe. So you're not alone. You go there to get recharged. Because when you're living this life, things are going to come your way. that are going to hit you and drain you and zap you. Well, thankfully, we're like, the, we're like the Energizer Bunny. We can go back to the Father and get a good recharge. Amen? We can spend time, and the Lord God is looking for that time for us, us together. He is wanting and longing to have that time together with him. He loves it when you set aside time to go into the prayer closet and seek his face. He loves it when you spend time with him and worshiping him. Listen, the worship that we do on Sunday mornings is just part of our daily lives with Christ. Hopefully this is not the only time that you worship the Lord. If it is, I want to encourage you to get in the presence of the Father every day of the week. It, you, you can. You can have that experience with Him. You, you can have that joy, unspeakable, full of glory. Hallelujah. You imagine walking into the workplace or the grocery store with the, the Holy Ghost anointing dripping all over you? Makes it a whole lot easier to grab those bagels. Walking in the glory. Oh, Lord, thank you for cottage cheese. Oh, I just praise you, Father. Mm. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, what's wrong with him? Uh, there's all, that's all right. Some of y'all like meatloaf. Yeah. <laughs> like, see, different, different tastes. But when I go pick up my cottage cheese, I'm like, Father God, thank you so much for cows. And, Lord, I thank you for milk. I'm being serious, dude. I'll just thank the Lord because I like that stuff. Amen? Certain smells. I'm glad that I can smell. <laughs> glad that I don't smell, but I can smell. There are certain smells that I really like. Sometimes I, it brings me back to when I was a kid. I'm having a flashback now, when I was a kid, we lived on uh, Buck Road in, in, in Damascus, Ohio. And mom would, would get Josh and I dressed up in, in waders, uh, the rubber boots. <laughs> they come up to here. Now, mind you, I was, you know, knee high to the grasshopper, so they were probably like this big. But they come up to here on me. <laughs> but the yard, it rained a lot there. I, I used to tease people, say, if it wasn't raining, it's snowing. Just take your pick. But the, the yard had uh, flooded a little bit down near the end on the other side of the driveway, I'm pointing to like you know where I'm talking about right now. So right there, you remember, right? <laughs> and I can remember in my waders, my rubber boots, and I'm going down there. I'm just a little kid, and my brother and I just walking around, and, and hopefully I don't feed this back, Mike, but walking around and sloshing around in that water. And the smell of, of fresh-cut grass and, and the smell of water, not stagnant water, but fresh water that's just filled a puddle, but this thing was huge. Okay, in my mind, it was huge because I was like this big, all right? It may not have been but six feet wide and ten feet long, but to me, it was as big as this room. So we're walking around in that thing and look, just looking around and watching the bubbles come up and smelling the smells. I'm thankful for a schnauzer that can smell. Amen? And I understand. I had a teacher in high school who couldn't smell. Uh, he could smell, if, if it, it had to be a really pugnant, really strong smell for him to smell it. And by that time, it, would, it was repulsive to him. Felt bad for the guy. I mean, he, had, he didn't have the, the, the joy of, of smelling like roses or, or cottage cheese. I mean, just whatever it was. Meatloaf, for those of you that like meatloaf, spaghetti. And so, but, but I'm thankful. And it, that's one of the things that I, I thank the Lord for. He said, well, that's, that's kind of small, isn't it? It doesn't matter. The creator of the universe thought enough about me and you to give a schnauzers that can smell. Hallelujah. A schnauzer is a nose, by the way, just in case if we're not on the same page. Speaking, speaking Southern right now, got that schnauzer on my face. It smells, smells. You don't say that, do you? You're like, that's, that's not a Southern thing. <laughs> Y'all, yunt some, fixing to, cut the lights on. 
I'm getting there, yeah. But, but God has given us so much that we can be thankful for. I'm thankful that I can see you right now. I mean, most of the time I can see you. It depends on where I'm standing on the stage. <laughs> Don't worry. If I'm looking at you, you think I'm looking at you and I'm up on that stage, I probably am not. I'm just looking in a general direction because <laughs> of the lights. Now I can see you because I'm down off the stage. But I'm thankful for eyesight. I'm thankful that I can hear you. There's so much that I'm thankful for. I hope you are too. I said all that to say that we can enter into worship no matter where we're at. We can enter into worship when we're driving our car, riding our motorcycle, or whether we're in the grocery store grabbing that next meatloaf or whatever it is you're grabbing. <laughs> I can worship the Lord wherever I'm at. Why? And I can be thankful no matter what situation I'm in. Even when things go south, I can still thank the Lord. Even when things seem to be coming against us from every angle, we can still thank the Lord. I'm thankful for the Lord for my formal education. But the things that really matter, I learn directly from the Lord when I'm all alone and have made the big, those times have made the biggest difference in my life. Through solitude, God brought the Apostle Paul out of the bitter Saul. The lawgiver Moses out of the murderer Moses. Let God do a radical spiritual surgery, a deeper work in your soul in the places of solitude. Have daily prayer, study and meditation in solitude. And again, solitude is not loneliness. Loneliness is the word we use to describe the pain of being alone. Solitude is the word we use to describe the glory of being alone. When you get to the point where you find that all you have is God, you'll discover that he is all you needed, need, and ever will need. In one region of Africa, the first converts to Christianity were very diligent about praying. In fact, the believers each had their own special place outside the village where they went to pray in solitude. And the villagers reached these prayer rooms by using their own private footpaths through the bush. I hope you're building a mental picture here this morning. When the grass begins to grow over one of these trails, it was evident that the person to whom it belonged to was not praying very much. And because these new Christians were concerned for each other's spiritual welfare, a unique custom sprang up. Whenever anyone noticed an overgrown prayer path, he or she would go to the person and lovingly warn, lovingly warn friend, there's grass on your path. So can I ask you this morning, is there grass on your path? They say the longer you put off going to school, the harder it is and less likely you'll go. After Paul graduated from the University of Solitude, he then took an advanced course in the University of Suffering. This one will bless you. Point number two this morning, God will school you at the school of suffering. Mm. When Paul returned to Damascus from Arabia, he was a marked and wanted man. He was lowered over the wall or down and over a wall, which was probably embarrassing and humiliating and may have been a little bit sketchy as well. This incident was only a foreshadowing of the suffering that was to come. Acts 9, 15 and 16, but the Lord said to him, that's Ananias, Go, for he, Saul, is chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. <laughs> Glory. I'm sure if Saul had heard, or Paul had heard that at that time, he probably might have asked for ID first. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. Are they, are they ministers of Christ? And Paul is speaking here. He says, I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. That's a lot. Three times I was beaten with rods. I want to stop right here for a second. When they beat you with rods, what it was designed to do is bruise the bone. When you bruise the bone, it takes about a year for that to stop hurting. Anytime you touch it, it hurts. I, le I learned something like this right after we we'd first gotten married. Jenny and I lived in a little house in Dazel, or Dazel, however you want to pronounce it. And I was working on a motor. And I had a little Dodge Ram D50. Some of you may remember those, a little mini truck. And as I was working on this, it was cold outside, and I had a ratchet in hand. 
and I was trying to break a, a bolt loose or a nut loose, and as I did, my hand slipped. Well, there's sharp objects on a motor, and I found it with my knuckle. And it, it laid my knuckle wide open. I mean, I'm talking right down to the bone, my, my middle knuckle there, and I still have a small scar from it. I mean, it just, whoosh, right open. And I, and I stopped, I looked at it, and I said, well, I guess I'm done. And <laughs> packed everything up. I went inside, cleaned it up, and I think I put some scotch tape on it just to get it back together. Not, I didn't go to the hospital, get stitches. I thought, why pay them when I've got scotch tape? What I didn't understand at that time was just how sore that knuckle was going to be for about a year. The skin healed up. I mean, it healed up in just, a, what, a week or so. I mean, it had a nice little scab there. It was a good war wound. But that knuckle, that knuckle right there, there were times I would be walking, and if I just bumped it like that, it sent the sharpest pain screaming through my body. My whole body knew that that knuckle had touched something it was not supposed to touch. My whole body winced in pain from that bruise, and it took about a year for it finally to go away. And I'm thankful I can report to you this day that I can touch that knuckle now. I can knock on doors. I worked maintenance at the time in an apartment complex, and it was not uncommon for us to knock on a door and say maintenance, yeah, right? Well, I didn't do that with this hand for quite a while. I did it with this hand because I knew if I touched this one, <laughs> amen. So <laughs> I said all this. I say all this to let you know, when people got beat with rods, when Paul got beat with rods, it was something designed not only to hurt him then, but also for about a year afterwards. So he got beat with rods. Ouch. Verse 25, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-five. 25, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And he's not talking about getting drunk. Okay? They... He went into a village, they did some miracles, and they killed him for it. He was dead. I'm positive of this. I mean, when people stone people, they, they didn't throw little pebbles at them. Okay? They picked up big rocks, as big as they could carry, and would stone people with them and hit them with them until they died. Paul gets up, the Lord raises him back up to life. And the reason I honestly believe that is because later on in Scriptures, Paul talks about a man who, whether in the body or out of the body, he does not know, but he had an experience in heaven. I really believe that was Paul. And it probably happened when they rocked him to sleep. So he was stoned. <laughs> three, three times I was shipwrecked. I needed some joy this morning. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. And journeys often in perils of water. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. And perils among false brethren, and weariness, and toil, and sleeplessness often, and hunger, and thirst, and fastings often, and cold, and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. I would say that Paul was under a little bit of stress. They say a measure of character is what it takes for you to quit. Paul must have had a lot of character. I've heard people quit churches for all kinds of reason. They want my money. Pastor, God bless you. Pastor gets up there and always talks about money. Tell them, get a job. <laughs> they want my money. Somebody didn't shake my hand. The people are not friendly enough. Or those people are too friendly. They wouldn't give me the ministry I wanted. I didn't like the pastor. Well, guess what? Paul would have stuck it out. Sometimes I don't like the pastor either. <laughs> what God had to teach him was taught and learned only by suffering. Not pleasant. It's not ni nice, but it was necessary. Suffering is never pleasant or nice, but it's necessary. Church, God looked down from heaven and saw you as a diamond in the rough. And right now, he's knocking off some of your rough edges. Hammer and chisels don't feel good or pleasant, but they are necessary. He puts us through the trials of suffering to burn out impurities that make us a better product. You're familiar with the, the illustration of gold and silver and how it's refined. It's heated up and turned into a liquid so that the impurities can come to the top, so that the master can scrape off the impurities. Some of us may be there this morning. There's an artist who took a 
big, huge block of marble, and he chiseled out a horse. And someone asked him, how did you make that? And he answered, I saw the horse in the marble, and I took away everything that didn't look like the horse. I like that. It's in this school we've learned our best lessons. God's chipping away at some of us today. Suffering isn't fun, but it's necessary to take off our rough edges. And I want to challenge you to pray this simple prayer when you're going through suffering. And it's just like this. It says, Lord, help me to learn what I'm supposed to learn through this suffering so I don't have to repeat it. Israelites could have saved them 40, 40 years, themselves 40 years of walking around the same mountain if they had just learned their lesson the first time. All right, so, so far we've looked at the school of solitude and the school of suffering. <laughs> this leads us to our final school this morning. God will school you at the school of seasoning, the school of seasoning. God sent Paul after solitude and suffering to Jerusalem. In Acts 9, 26, when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Galatians 1, 18, and after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with uh, Peter and stayed with him 15 days. The word acquainted is used over 1,400 times in Scripture, but here it is only used in this way, the Greek word hysterio, which where we get our word history. Paul went to Jerusalem to do a history on Peter. Peter, tell me everything that happened. Paul wasn't there when Jesus had an earthly ministry, raised the dead, fed the 5,000, arose from the dead, etc. So for 15 solid days, he sat with Peter and got the whole story. Paul became Peter's protege, if you will. We all need someone who is more experienced than us, who's been at it a while, been there, done that, and all that, to give us that, or to get that t-shirt that they've got. Peter pulled Paul up to a level, shared with him the ropes. He seasoned Paul. I'm going to say this. Every believer needs a mentor, a ministry partner to be accountable to, someone more seasoned. Another thing, be here every time the doors are open. God has great things to pour into you at least three times a week right here. You cheat yourself if you choose to forego the seasoning process. I've been blessed with several mentors who have allowed me to stand on their shoulders several decades of experience. So thank you. To have someone season you, you must admit that you don't have all the answers and there's room for improvement. Allow others to pour themselves into you. You seek out a mentor. Don't wait on them. People aren't going to seek you out and say, I want to be your mentor. That's a rare, rare case if that's the case. You seek them out. Unfortunately, epitaph of many men, as well expressed in these words, Died at age 26, was buried at 64. Think about that one for a minute. If you stop learning and growing today, you stop ministering tomorrow. <clears throat> Recent statistics show that the average Christian stops growing five to seven years after conversion. Folks, that shouldn't be. That can change if we choose to continue our education in the Lord. If you've been saved more than five to seven years, I want to encourage you to do a quick inventory. Are, are we growing? I have to ask myself this too. Am I growing? I shouldn't be the same tomorrow as I was yesterday. I shouldn't be the same a year from now as I was a year ago. Are you with me? Okay. So in conclusion, we've looked at three places God takes us back to school. The University of Solitude. The University of Suffering and the University of Seasoning. So the question is, what school do you need to study more in today? I'm going to ask you to stand and for the praise team to come, I want to share with you one more story about a young Colombian girl who received a New Testament in her school. She, she read the New Testament until one day her father caught her reading it and told her not to read it anymore because it was full of lies and fantasy. But the girl kept on reading her New Testament until one day her father came home unexpectedly, found her with the New Testament, grabbed it from her hands and put it into his pocket. The father went off to work where he was a mining engineer. And several hours later, sirens went off in the community. There had been a cave-in at the mine. The father was trapped in the mine and the rescue workers took five days to finally reach the men, but it was too late. All 31 men died, including the father of this little girl. Curiously, though, 
The workers found the man clutching the New Testament between his praying hands. And when they opened the front, front cover, they read a note. To my daughter, keep reading this New Testament. It is true and right. And I will see you one day in heaven. Then they turned to the back page where the father had signed the commitment card after having said the sinner's prayer, but that was not the end of the story. Turning the page, there were signed the names of the other 30 workers. Hallelujah. The eternity was changed because of what a young girl got when she went back to school. Their eternity has changed and we'll see them one day in heaven. So what are we gonna do? Which school are we at? Which school should we need to apply in? Are you ready to go back to school this morning? As the praise team leads us in a song, I just want for those that will, you, there's no pressure here. Those that will, would you come and just ask the Lord, Lord, what school do I need to enroll in this morning? And to be willing to hear from him and to follow after him. And my question is, will you still follow him if it's the school of suffering? Will you still follow him if it's the school of seasoning and somebody's pouring themselves into you? No matter what school it may be, will you follow and will you obey? Will you no longer lean on your own understanding, but trust him? with all of your heart. If you need Jesus Christ as Savior, I'd love to pray with you this morning. Please come to me and I'll talk with you about him. But for the rest, if you want to come and just ask the Lord, Lord, where do you want me? Would you please come as the praise team leads us in a song this morning? Father God, we come before you and ask to show us which school you need us in. Lord, if it's a school of solitude, we choose to set time aside this week and continuing on to get in your presence so that we can hear from you. And I thank you for giving us the ears to hear and the eyes to see and hearts to comprehend. We just thank you ahead of time for speaking to us. Lord, if it's the school of suffering, then I ask for your grace and your mercy to go through these things. I ask for your strength and your guidance and your counsel as well. Lord, if it's the school of seasoning, then I pray that you give us wisdom on the people we should approach to mentor us. And Lord, I thank you for placing it on the hearts of our older generation that have been there, done that, and have the t-shirt 
to be those mentors. And I thank you, Lord, for giving us a heart for one another that when, when the toe hurts, that we stop and minister. That when the hand hurts, we stop and minister. That no matter what's hurting, that we can help to, to ease the pain and to, to stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I uplift our brothers and sisters in other countries that can't get together and worship freely, specifically China right now, Lord. I ask for your strength and mercy upon them, and I pray for your guidance and direction and your healing and touch. We love you, Father, and praise you. Please take us to school and where we need to go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Thank you for coming this morning. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight in small groups.